Good afternoon. Good to see everyone. A few things uh, at the top. The United States calls on President Daniel Ortega and the Nicaraguan government to immediately release presidential candidates Cristina Chamorro, Arturo Cruz, Felix Maradiaga, and Juan Sebastian Chamorro, as well as other civil society and opposition leaders who have been arrested over the past week in an increasing wave of repression. The United States condemns these actions in the most unequivocal terms and holds President Ortega and those who carry out his authoritarian orders responsible for their safety and well-being. The regime's repressive actions, including a number of arrests even last night, have sent independent journalists, activists, and student leaders into hiding for fear of reprisals. In response, and we just announced this, the Department of the Treasury, the United States is imposing sanctions on several members of the Ortega regime who are complicit in the regime's repression. And that includes for its failure to implement the electoral reforms called for by the Organization of American States and the UN Human Rights Council. Today, the United States announces sanctions on Camila Ortega Murillo, an advisor and daughter of Daniel Ortega, Leonardo Ovidio Reyes Ramirez, the president of the Central Bank of Nicaragua, Julio Modesto Rodriguez Valladares, a military general, and Edwin Ramon Castro Rivera, a National Assembly deputy. As these sanctions demonstrate, there are costs for those who are complicit in the regime's repression. The United States will continue to use diplomatic and economic tools against members of the regime engaged in this wave of repression. Next. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, just had a chance to, to see Ambassador Hammer. Uh, he will be, uh, I'm, I'm very flattered you uh, compared me to him. Uh, the United States condemns in the strongest terms the senseless killings, uh, killing of at least 160 civilians, including children, in Burkina Faso on the night of June 4th to June 5th. We stand with our Burkinabe partners in the fight against violent extremism. We extend our, our sincere condolences to the families of the victims of this heinous attack, and we call for those responsible to be held accountable. And finally, we condemn in the strongest terms today's horrific attack in Baglan, Af Afghanistan, which killed 10 and injured at least 16 hum humanitarian D miners with the international NGO, NGO the HALO Trust. The HALO Trust has conducted demining operations in Afghanistan for many years now, essential work that benefits all Afghans. As Ambassador Wilson said, mine clearers are the bravest of the brave, and they risk their lives to make Afghanistan a safe place where all people can prosper. We offer our condolences to all those affected and call for an immediate investigation into this heinous attack. Uh, so with that, we'll turn to your questions. Thanks, Ned. Um, I have a couple that relate to testimony that the Secretary gave over the course of the last couple of days, but I'll split them up and I'll just do one at a time and let others go. So let's just start with Nord Stream 2. Uh, it was not exactly a pleasant um, time uh, for the Secretary on Nord Stream 2, uh, his testimony, his, his hearings. He got pretty much roundly criticized by both people on both sides of the lawmakers on both sides of the aisle for the last round of sanctions and the, and the waivers. Um, in, in response to that criticism, he made the same point, he made the same points and said uh, that you don't want to poison the well with Germany for something that's a fait accompli. Um, and then noted, as I think you have done as well, that uh, the Germans have already come to the table with proposal. I'd like to know what your understanding of that German proposal is, because my understanding of it is that it's exactly the same thing that they offered two years ago. Um, that would be reverse flows of gas into Ukraine, payments to Ukraine, and not insignificant payments to Ukraine to make up for the loss of revenue, and also a snapback measure or shutting off of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline if it is determined that Russia is using energy as a political weapon. So I, I, is your understanding of what the Germans have come, the German proposal, is it any different than, than that? And if it's not, uh, you know, it's a two-year-old offer. It has nothing to do with the waiver or poisoning or non-poisoning of the well. Well, Matt, let me uh, start 
with our overall overall goal. And you've heard this uh, from us before, but it's it bears repeating because this is something um, for which there is actually great bipartisan agreement, um, including in the halls of Congress. And our goal remains uh, to ensure that Russia cannot use energy as a coercive tool against Ukraine or anyone else in the region. And that's why our position on Nord Stream 2 has been clear and very consistent over time. Uh, it is a Russian geopolitical project that threatens European energy security and undermines the security of Ukraine and the eastern flank, NATO allies, and partners. And so that is why, uh, including most recently in May, we have continued uh, to uh, assess potentially sanctionable activity and to impose sanctions as a result of that. Last month, uh, we imposed sanctions on four Russian entities that engaged, engaged in the sanctionable activities under PISA. Um, and we listed four Russian vessels as blocked property. We also listed as blocked property nine vessels belonging to the Russian government's Marine Rescue Service, all of which are part of the Nord Stream 2 construction fleet. This, in fact, was the largest sanction action taken to date uh, in an effort uh, to stop Nord Stream 2. Um, well, well, hold on a second. I, I, I understand all that, and I know that that's what the talking points are, but the fact of the matter is is that the Secretary said that it was a fait accompli. It's going to be done anyway. So you're not really trying to stop it with these sanctions. If you were, you wouldn't have issued the waivers. And when you say that there is great bipartisan agreement on Nord Stream 2, that is precisely the reason why there was great bipartisan excuse me, great bipartisan criticism of the Secretary's decision that he heard personally from Democrats and Republicans over the course of the last two days on the Hill. What you heard yesterday from the Secretary is that the pipeline, by the time this administration took office, uh, was about 90 percent complete, uh, more than 90 percent uh, complete. Uh, and so, uh, yes, as the Secretary said yesterday, the physical construction of the pipeline uh, would be difficult uh, to impede. Um, our goal remains the same, though, and that is to ensure that Russia cannot use energy as a geopolitical tool uh, against Ukraine or any other uh, country uh, in the region. And there is great bipartisan uh, agreement on that. Sanctions are one tool. They are an important tool. And we have used sanctions uh, to uh, good effect, including uh, last month and the largest sanctions uh, ever uh, announced in the context of this project. But they're not the only tool. Uh, diplomacy is... Uh, another important tool. That includes uh, diplomacy um, with our uh, close allies, uh, and that includes well, uh, Germany in this case. And I will just say that um, Secretary Blinken has had a number of occasions to meet with uh, Foreign Minister Moss, uh, to speak with Foreign Minister Moss. Uh, we have, of course, met uh, on a couple times now with uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba uh, of Ukraine, uh, with uh, President Zelensky uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and in every one of those conversations, uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, has been uh, a focus. And the focus continues to be how the United States can work with uh, our allies, work with our partner Ukraine, uh, to make sure uh, that this project um, is not used to coerce uh, our friends uh, and allies. That's what we're concerned about. That's what we are uh, determined to work to prevent. Yeah. Well, it sounds as though then it is. It sounds as though what you're hoping to do is to have a situation where the pipeline is completed physically, but nothing goes through it, except well, for maybe like air or we, something. We are Water. certainly we are certainly I mean, not hoping to have the pipeline completed. In fact, well, it's uh, too late. You already basically he, he you know well, you've conceded the point that it's going to be you, finished you, already. You, you, so you are you are right. And the president and the secretary did yesterday. I, I just I just wonder how realistic that is. It's like you know, watching the Turks buy the S-400 and asking them not to take them out of the crates, you know, or not turn them on. So you think that the Russians and the Germans are going to spend all this money to build a pipeline and you're going to convince them somehow not to send any gas through it? Our goal uh, remains uh, to see to it, to do everything we can through, yes, through sanctions, uh, but also through diplomacy and engagement uh, with our uh, close ally, Germany, uh, with Ukraine, uh, with other affected countries in the region, to see to it that this pipeline cannot be used as a geopolitical weapon. Uh, that's 
what we're committed okay, to. Last one, then. Do you think that you, operationalizing the pipeline, in other words, sending energy, gas, whatever, through it is uh, allowing Russia to have geopolitical, uh, to, pre to apply pressure on Europe? We are going to do everything we can to ensure that Russia cannot do that. Uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of uh, diplomacy. Uh, of course, uh, the president will have an opportunity to engage uh, with our uh, but German the mere counterparts. Fact of turning it on, do you think does that constitute again, Russian pressure? Again, I, I don't want to get ahead of where we are. Uh, this has been the topic of concerted discussion, concerted diplomacy, and it will continue to be the topic of concerted discussion and concerted diplomacy, including uh, in the coming days as the president and secretary uh, are in Europe. Please, Sean. Thanks. Uh, can I switch to the Middle East? Sure. Um, uh, the, uh, in the wake of the violence, uh, the Prime Minister in Netanyahu's office has given the, the green light uh, for now for the, the march that has drawn a lot of controversy among, uh, among nationalists. What's, uh, does the United States have any take on this about whether it should be held? Has the United States engaged in any diplomacy on, on, uh, on how to go forward on this? Well, uh, this gets back to um, what we have um, been saying both uh, publicly uh, including from this podium, uh, including from the White House, um, but also privately uh, in the context of our diplomacy uh, with the Israelis, uh, with the Palestinian Authority, uh, with other uh, regional stakeholders uh, over uh, the past several weeks. And it's, it's, it's very simple. We believe it's essential to refrain from steps that exacerbate tensions. We have worked, the United States, uh, working closely with our Egyptian counterparts, of course, uh, engaging in concerted diplomacy um, with uh, Israel and also with the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we worked intensively uh, behind the scenes, uh, if uh, almost always quietly, uh, to bring about this ceasefire. Uh, this ceasefire after uh, more than a week of violence that was horrifying, violence uh, that was um, devastating, um, uh, that cost the lives of innocent civilians, uh, innocent Israeli and Palestinian uh, civilians. And it is our goal, um, working with those uh, same parties, the, the two parties, as well as uh, other regional stakeholders, to see to it uh, that this ceasefire uh, holds uh, and that we do not see a return uh, to violence. Now, part of that is about what we're doing over the medium term and the long term. Uh, and we have spoken to that in some detail by, um, in the first instance, seeking to uh, uh, rebuild, uh, seeking to provide humanitarian relief uh, to uh, the Palestinian people uh, as a way to offer a degree of opportunity and hope uh, that the Palestinians, uh, including those in Gaza, have not had uh, for some time now. Our, our goal in all of this remains the same, to see to it that Israelis and Palestinians enjoy equal measures of safety, of security, of prosperity, of democracy, and importantly, of dignity, uh, in order to try and break uh, this cycle of violence. Now, of course, um, that is something that will be a long-term effort. Uh, and we have spoken of the millions of dollars uh, in humanitarian uh, relief and aid uh, that, we are, um, uh, that we have allocated uh, towards this project. Uh, and we continue to work with the international community uh, in an effort uh, not only to rebuild, um, but uh, also um, to uh, improve structural conditions um, for uh, the Palestinian people in an effort to break the cycle of violence. The other part of this, however, is to see to it that uh, do everything we can um, to try to prevent um, escalations uh, or provocations that might provide a spark uh, to renewed violence. Uh, and so that is why we continue um, to speak uh, uh, privately, uh, to engage privately uh, with Israelis uh, and with Palestinians and with others in the region um, to avoid steps that exacerbate uh, these underlying tensions. Can I just follow up on that? You say uh, provocations that might provide a spark to renewed violence. Could the march be among those? Uh, well, look, um, we all saw um, uh, what precipitated uh, the last flare up uh, of violence. Um, and we know uh, just how delicate this situation. Uh, is. So I don't want to put um, uh, an undue spotlight on any particular um, escalation, um, but I think uh, to us it is important uh, that um, uh, all sides refrain from steps uh, that exacerbate tensions and that they actively take steps uh, to avoid 
um, provocations or escalations. Yes. Uh, Axios has reported that the U.S. Uh, uh, Israel Working Group on Palestinian Affairs met on Monday for the first time to discuss the Biden administration's in intentions of reopening the consulate in Jerusalem. Uh, is it accurate? And uh, did you take any decisions in this regard? Well, uh, what I would say broadly is that the president, um, the secretary of state, uh, they are committed to working towards equal measures, as I said before, of freedom, of security, prosperity, and of dignity uh, for Israelis and for Palestinians alike. Uh, we intend to do so in tangible ways in the immediate term. Uh, in that regard, uh, the United States is working closely with both Israelis and Palestinians, as well as the United Nations, uh, to advance that vision. Uh, we have uh, Secretary Blinken, when he was in uh, the region, in Ramallah and in Jerusalem, uh, spoke of our commitment to reopening uh, the um, uh, uh, CG, the Consul General, uh, in uh, Jerusalem uh, for uh, the Palestinian people to be able to re-engage diplomatically um, with the Palestinian people uh, and with the Palestinian Authority. And anything on this meeting? I don't have any uh, specific street out. And the, my second uh, one is uh, on uh, this topic too. Israeli Foreign Minister has said that the Biden administration is likely to appoint a Middle East envoy who will focus on strengthening the normalization agreements between Israel and the Arab world. And the Washington Post reported Friday that uh, former ambassador to Israel, Dan Shapiro, was being considered for the envoy role. Is it accurate? And do you have anything on this? Well, it probably won't surprise you to hear that I have nothing to say when it comes to uh, personnel uh, announcements. But uh, the the general idea um, is one uh, that we've spoken to before. Uh, and we um, believe that we can be a constructive uh, force. The U.S. can be um, uh, uh, helpful. Um, and that we intend uh, to build on uh, these normalization agreements uh, because they are in Israel's interest. Uh, they are in uh, uh, the interests of the region. Um, but we also know, uh, and Secretary Blinken has spoken to this, uh, that they are no substitute uh, for demonstrable, demonstrable progress uh, when it comes to the conflict between uh, Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and so, yes, uh, we do uh, support uh, the, uh, these normalization agreements. We do intend uh, to build on them, just as we remain engaged um, with uh, the Palestinian people, with the Palestinian Authority, with our uh, Israeli counterparts uh, in an effort, again, uh, to break the cycle of violence and to provide that sense of hope, that sense of opportunity uh, and, and dignity uh, for Israelis and Palestinians alike. But you still don't want to call the Abraham. There, there, are, there are completed agreements, the Abraham Accords. Uh, we are focused. <laughs> I, 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 very I, I, briefly, does but, but can I can I say one thing? I, and I know this room tends to be fixated no, on what we call things. You 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 know you're a stickler for terminology. Uh, I think that uh, what we would say uh, is we um, uh, pay a lot more attention to uh, the underlying idea uh, and the motivation uh, and the objective rather than uh, what we call them. Fair enough. Uh, does the administration subscribe to the uh, to the argument that uh, a lot of the on the in the Palestinian community have that the consulate general must be in Jerusalem? Shouldn't be. There have been some suggestions that you may put it put one in Ramallah or somewhere else, Jericho, I mean even Bethlehem. Um, but the argument is that it needs to be in Jerusalem because the Palestinians still regard or still claim uh, at least East Jerusalem to be the capital of a future state. Is that something well, the administration agrees with? So a couple things. The status of Jerusalem is a final status issue uh, to be negotiated yeah, uh, but, but between the parties. But uh, previously, um, before uh, the previous administration closed it, it of course was uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of uh, where we are. Secretary Blinken has committed that we will uh, reopen uh, the consulate uh, in an effort to re-engage with Jerusalem. To so I'm just wanting to know, do you think that it's important for the consul general to reopen in Jerusalem? It, that's where it was before. Um, Secretary okay, Blinken. But, you know, things move. You know. <laughs> Correct. Uh, but Secretary Blinken has committed that we will uh, reopen uh, the consulate. <laughs> Secondly, the um, um, uh, the administration is committed. You, you mentioned all the money going to the re restoration of relations with the Palestinians and aid going there. It, do, does the administration think it's realistic to set, put put a whole bunch of money into Gaza, into the reconstruction of Gaza, that actually completely avoids? Hamas, um, 
it, it seems to be uh, it seems to be an unrealistic goal to try to re I mean any everything in Gaza is run by Hamas. How do you how exactly do you end? Well, what we know, Matt, uh, and what the Israelis know, and and what the Palestinian people know, is that Hamas has wrought nothing but destruction uh, and uh, engendered violence um, within Gaza. Uh, and so that is why uh, it is important to us that in providing this humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people, uh, we don't inadvertently perpetuate this cycle of violence by further empowering or enriching Hamas. The question is, how do you pour all this money in to help reconstruct Gaza, the infrastructure, everything else, improve people's lives, give them hope at what you say? How do you do that without well, having any of that money? How we do it is, is how we do it around the world in different contexts. Uh, we will provide assistance in the West Bank and Gaza through experience, experienced and through trusted independent partners on the ground uh, who distribute directly to people in need, uh, not going through uh, de facto uh, government authorities. Uh, our development and humanitarian partners in the West Bank uh, and Gaza have aggressive risk mitigation systems in place aimed at ensuring that taxpayer funds uh, are reaching those for whom it is intended, the women uh, the men, the children, uh, most in need of that assistance. We'll be working closely with the United Nations. We'll be working closely uh, with our Egyptian partners uh, in this effort So you as well. believe that it's possible to build a building, to construct a road, to repair a sewer without Hamas having anything to do with it? I we mean, it we believe like, that know, it is possible. Collection in New York we believe in that it is possible to provide assistance. Right. Uh, and in fact, in our benefit, in the ben to the benefit of Israel and, of course, to the benefit of the Palestinian people, uh, to provide them with much-needed humanitarian assistance. Last one. Yesterday, or the day before, the Secretary mentioned concerns about UNRWA textbooks um, and that you guys were looking at very closely. Mm -hmm. I just want to know, does that, does that concern, has that translated into any uh, diminution or suspension of the resumption of funding for UNRWA? Well, uh, in our communications uh, with the agency, UNRWA uh, has made firm commitments to the United States uh, on various issues. That includes transparency, uh, accountability, uh, and neutrality uh, in all of its operations. Uh, and that commitment to uh, neutrality specifically, it includes zero tolerance for racism, for discrimination, uh, and for anti-Semitism. Uh, UNRWA's Head Commissioner General uh, Lazzarini um, conveyed his utmost commitment uh, to these um, principles, and we'll be watching very closely. But yes. there has been no, it hasn't affected any of the assistance, the, the money going to UNRWA now, the uh, stuff that's been announced already. We, we have made, still going. We have made very clear the risk mitigation measures, um, both publicly and in our conversations with Congress uh, when it comes to UNRWA. Yeah, but there hasn't been, it hasn't, the concerns that you have about this have not impacted the aid so far, correct? Uh, uh, our, our, what we have announced, um, there has been no change in that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Nora with La Vanguardia, Spain. Um, speaking on the, about the Abraham agreements, President Biden and Secretary Blinken are starting their trip to Europe today, where I think they will convey to the Allies their message about the U.S. being back in the world, diplomacy is back, multilateralism is back. But how does this approach fit with the decision to, so far, stick to the policy switch made by Donald Trump concerning the sovereignty of the Western Sahara to support Morocco's aspirations instead of the United Nations position. How do you conciliate both statements, or is maybe the State Department um, about to review its position on this policy switch? Um, secondly, also regarding President uh, Biden and Secretary Blinken trip to Europe, will the U.S. reconsider the travel restrictions currently in place for the European Union countries and the U.K., as these measures actually do not apply to other travelers coming from countries where the infection rates are much higher <coughs> and the vaccination rates much uh, lower? And third and finally, uh, regarding Latin America and specifically Nicaragua, we saw the acting uh, assistant secretary message of condemnation on uh, Ortega's regime latest actions. But she said that um, the U.S. would like the, the world to act, that the international community would act. What do you want the international community to do? And also, would the U.S. Um, support the activation or enforcement of the charge of the Organization of the American States to Nicaragua? Thank you very much. Okay. 
Um, I will start with your question about uh, travel um, uh, restrictions that remain in place. Um, as you know, this is a question of public health. Uh, and recognizing uh, the importance of travel uh, to our citizens and uh, their families, uh, as well as the critical role of uh, trade uh, as well. Um, yesterday, uh, the Biden administration announced, announced the launch of a series of expert uh, working groups with four uh, key partners, Canada, Mexico, uh, in the case of Spain, the EU, uh, as well as with the United Kingdom, uh, to determine going forward how best uh, to safely uh, reopen uh, travel. Uh, through these working groups, uh, we will um, be able to uh, chart roadmaps uh, to reopen uh, international travel safely. Uh, importantly, this is not a uh, political question. Of course, uh, our ties with um, all of these countries and all of these entities um, are uh, uh, profoundly uh, deep. This is about public safety, and so decisions going forward um, will be um, based on um, public health uh, concerns. It will be informed uh, by uh, CDC. The State Department uh, will take part uh, in these expert uh, working groups, but ultimately um, these will be uh, questions um, about uh, public health. Uh, when it comes to Western Sahara, um, we're consulting privately um, with the parties about how best to halt the violence and achieve a lasting settlement. Uh, I don't have anything uh, further uh, to announce at this time, but um, I would certainly um, take issue uh, with the characterization that there's been a, con uh, a continuity, um, including when it comes to um, our uh, approach uh, towards uh, the region uh, from the last administration, and even in this briefing alone, um, it's in some detail. We've talked about uh, our efforts uh, to bring equal measures of safety, of security, of prosperity, of democracy, and of dignity. Uh, to Israelis uh, and to Palestinians uh, alike. And if you take a look uh, at what we have said, uh, and more importantly, what we have done uh, in the context of um, uh, this, this region, uh, I think you will see uh, any number uh, of very uh, important uh, and, in fact, uh, profound differences. Um, when it comes to uh, Nicaragua, um, I said before, um, uh, today the Treasury, Department of the Treasury announced sanctions uh, against some of those responsible uh, for enabling uh, the crackdown uh, on uh, uh, democracy and for limiting uh, the free will of the Nicaraguan uh, people. And we have uh, taken action uh, accordingly. Um, it has become clear, including in the past few days alone, uh, that uh, under uh, President Ortega, Nicaragua is becoming uh, an international pariah. Uh, moving farther away from uh, democracy. This was something that we had an opportunity to discuss, that Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to discuss in the context of our travel to Costa Rica just the other day. Uh, Nicaragua is, uh, of course, uh, a member of uh, SICA, uh, and we discussed this uh, in both bilateral and multilateral settings uh, with uh, some of our partners, our shared concerns, the shared concerns on the part of uh, other uh, SICA members uh, other uh, close partners in the region uh, about what we see happening, uh, in many cases right before our eyes, uh, when it comes to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, we announced our own um, uh, measures of accountability. Uh, they, we have additional tools at our disposal uh, to hold um, members of the regime or those who enable them uh, to account, uh, and we will uh, not hesitate uh, to do so. Uh, Secretary Blinken also uh, had an opportunity on the sidelines of the SICA uh, uh, meeting uh, to make uh, some of these points directly to the Nicaraguan for foreign minister. Uh, and the message that uh, Secretary Blinken conveyed to him is um, um, one that he has also uh, noted publicly. The, the Nicaraguans often talk about the progress that the Ortega regime uh, has affected in Nicaragua, what they have brought for uh, the Nicaraguan people. And Secretary's Blinken, Secretary Blinken's message was very simple. Uh, if you have accomplished all of these things for your people, if you have improved lives uh, in the way you say you have, uh, let the people uh, exercise their free will. Let a free and fair election uh, go forward. Uh, that is what um, we are uh, striving uh, to uh, help bring about uh, nothing more and nothing less uh, than the ability of the Nicaraguan people to choose their own destiny uh, and to exercise uh, their own uh, free will. It's a right to which 
the Nicaraguan people are guaranteed and to which all people are guaranteed. Yes. Follow up question, sorry, on my, um, just also for the sake of clarity concerning the Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. I was referring specifically to the policy switch concerning um, Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, are we wrong to assume that there is continuity in the U.S. position on the issue? It's one, it's an issue that we have discussed um, directly uh, with uh, our counterparts in Morocco, our counterparts uh, in Spain, uh, and elsewhere uh, through the region. But I think more broadly, uh, there is uh, very little uh, continuity, I think it is safe to say, uh, when it comes to uh, our approach uh, to uh, the broader region. Uh, but she's specifically asking about recognition of the Sahara. Right. And you're saying that you're, it's not con it's, there's no continuity between this administration and the last administration. What, what I'm saying is I don't have any. Have you revoked the what I, recognition? What of I'm saying is I don't have anything uh, to announce uh, <laughs> at the moment. But I, I think if you look at Western Sahara as part of a previous administration's broader approach um, to the region in the context of the Abraham Accords. Um, that is where you see quite a bit of discontinuity um, between the approach uh, we have pursued and we have enacted um, versus uh, what the previous administration uh, did, Connor. There are several states now that have growing stockpiles of unused vaccine doses. Um, a State Department spokesperson said this morning that if states have additional vaccines, the U.S. government is, quote, committed to working to make sure that vaccine is utilized. Does that mean that you are actively considering working with states to coordinate with them and, and provide those doses overseas? Well, uh, as, as you heard from us this morning, it's, it's incredibly important, not only to the State Department, but also to this full administration, that uh, we make maximum use of the vaccine supply uh, that we have in this country. Uh, and you have heard uh, of us talk of uh, our plans for that excess vaccine supply uh, so far. Uh, and President Biden made very clear uh, and pledged to uh, donate uh, 80 million doses uh, before the end of this month uh, to countries around the world. And just a few days ago, uh, we laid out the framework uh, for uh, doing so. I think you may have heard from President Biden this morning that um, he'll be speaking um, uh, in greater detail uh, to what the United States um, will be positioned uh, to do um, beyond what we have already committed. And it's a, it's a great deal to which we've committed. It's not only those 80, billion, 80 million uh, doses, um, but it is the uh, uh, $2 billion uh, to COVAX with $2 billion uh, additional over time. Uh, it is our focus on increased manufacturing capacity, including uh, in the context uh, of the Quad. It's a sharing arrangement uh, that we have spoken to uh, in the context of our relationship uh, with Canada and uh, Mexico, uh, as well as any number of other steps to demonstrate uh, that the United States uh, will help to lead the way out of uh, this pandemic. Uh, we've said before that as long as the coronavirus is left in the wild anywhere, as long it is, as it is free to, to mutate, it poses a threat to uh, people everywhere, including Americans uh, here at home. But now that we are confident in our own vaccine supply uh, here at home, that uh, we have made um, significant progress with our own efforts, we are in a position uh, to do more. Uh, that's precisely what we've said uh, in the context of those 80 million doses. If there are unused um, vaccine supply uh, that would otherwise uh, go to waste, we're going to do everything we can to ensure that those doses uh, are used and put to, put to good use. Um, but I don't have specific details Does to share. Does that include those doses that have been provided to states already, though? Is it possible to coordinate with state governments to return those to the federal government and then provide them overseas? I, I wouldn't want to go into that from here. Uh, the, the White House, I would refer you to the White House um, when it comes to uh, the potential logistics of uh, doing so. But we have spoken uh, to our commitment uh, to um, lead the world uh, out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, even now, with the 80 million doses uh, we have uh, allocated for uh, sharing, 75% through COVAX, 25% uh, bilaterally, we are sharing uh, five times more than any other country around the world. Uh, and we're, again, we're not doing so um, because it is a function of um, uh, trading favors or diplomacy. Uh, we're doing so um, because we know uh, that we have a unique capacity to help lead the world out of this pandemic. It's the right thing to do, uh, and it's precisely what we're doing. Yes. Thank you. Just to follow up first. Uh, U.S. vaccines have started arriving in South Asia. Do you know when the first lot of U.S. vaccine would arrive in India? 
And do you have a figure on how much, uh, what's the number of vaccines that US would, India would be receiving this first lot? Uh, thank you. So uh, I don't have the specific details on when the uh, shipment of vaccines uh, will be arriving in India. Of course, India will be in receipt uh, of a share of those 80 million uh, vaccines. Uh, and through COVAX, uh, I believe there were uh, some 6 million uh, vaccines destined uh, for uh, the region. We know that um, India has suffered tremendously uh, at um, uh, with this with this uh, pandemic, uh, and as we have done in the case of these vaccines, but also uh, as we did uh, even prior to this vaccine sharing announcement, we have demonstrated our commitment uh, to work uh, closely uh, with our uh, partners in India uh, to help see the way out uh, of this uh, epidemic. We have uh, spoken of uh, our commitment of. Uh, seven plane loads of life-saving supplies worth approximately $100 million uh, that uh, went to uh, India in recent weeks. Um, but this is also in addition to the tremendous generosity uh, that we have uh, seen from the private sector uh, and the diaspora uh, here in this country that has donated uh, some 400 million additional dollars. So that's half a billion dollars uh, that the United States government uh, and the people here in the United States have committed uh, to help our friends uh, and to help uh, our partners in India uh, recover from this pandemic. While the private sector, as you mentioned, and the Indian Americans continue to raise funds for, for India COVID-19 assistance, uh, is the U.S. government still continuing with their uh, COVID-19 assistance to India or has it stopped now? Uh, we are absolutely continuing with our commitment uh, to help uh, the government and the people of India uh, emerge from uh, this pandemic. Uh, when it comes to the private sector, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, Coordinator uh, Gail Smith, um, others uh, within the administration helped to spearhead uh, some of those commitments on the part of the private sector. We remain engaged uh, with uh, the private sector uh, as we have spoken of our commitment of vaccines uh, to India, of our commitment of plane loads of life-saving supplies, uh, doing all we can not only on our part but also uh, to galvanize action uh, on the part of other non-governmental actors here in the United States uh, to help our friends in India. Thank you. Yes. North Korea? Sure. So uh, you completed uh, the policy review on North Korea last month, but we haven't heard you know, much about it since then. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could uh, give us some updates on your current effort uh, dealing with North Korea. I assume that you've uh, shared uh, the, the final policy uh, with North Korea. So I also would like to know if there was any uh, uh, responses from North Korean side. Um, uh, if not, uh, how long can you wait? I mean, uh, what, what's next? Also, um, the IAEA uh, director general a couple of days ago said uh, the DPRK's nuclear activities remain a uh, cause for serious concern. Mm -hmm. um, the director general uh, signaled that there are still uh, ongoing activities in North Korea's uh, nuclear facilities. Uh, so do you have any uh, comment, comments on that as well? Well, the concern that you heard from the IAEA about North Korea's uh, nuclear program uh, is precisely in large part what animated uh, our policy review. Uh, we know that North Korea's nuclear uh, program, North Korea's ballistic missile arsenal, uh, poses a threat not only um, to uh, the United States, but also uh, to our allies, including our treaty allies uh, in the region. Uh, and it's precisely why we undertook this review uh, with a great deal of urgency, um, but with also a great deal of care. And you're right that we did, uh, we have completed uh, the review. It was thorough, it was rigorous, it was inclusive. Uh, as I've said, uh, we consulted uh, with those uh, very same uh, treaty allies, including those in Seoul, those in Tokyo, um, but also uh, more broadly throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and we also have had a chance uh, to uh, discuss it with other uh, global allies and partners. Similarly, we consulted with outside experts, uh, including those who have uh, worked uh, this challenge uh, in the context of uh, previous uh, administrations. We recognize uh, with some degree of, of humility uh, that what the United States um, has uh, attempted before uh, with North Korea uh, has not in large part made the challenge any better. Um, uh, that includes uh, the threat that emanates uh, from North Korea or um, for uh, the conditions uh, for the people inside. Uh, North Korea. So the policy that we have spoken to uh, calls for uh, what we have um, 
deemed a calibrated uh, practical approach that explores diplomacy, that is predicated on uh, diplomacy with the DPRK uh, to make tangible progress that increases the security for our people, um, for, uh, uh, the, uh, for our allies in the region, uh, as well as for uh, deployed uh, forces. And we did announce uh, that Ambassador Sun Kim uh, will um, uh, serve as uh, the special representative uh, for the DPRK. And uh, Ambassador Kim uh, will, for our part, um, continue to uh, be deeply uh, engaged in this uh, and will be um, heading our efforts to explore uh, that practical, principled uh, diplomacy to make uh, progress uh, where we can. Um, I wouldn't want to speak to um, any, nor any uh, DPRK reaction uh, to this policy. We have said before that uh, we've reached out uh, to uh, the North Koreans. Um, uh, I don't have any update uh, for you uh, there, but um, uh, uh, we have focused our efforts on consulting closely uh, with our allies uh, and with our partners, knowing that this is a challenge uh, that we can't address alone, uh, that if we are going to make uh, the demonstrable progress that we seek to make, uh, in the context of our own security, in the context of the security for our treaty allies and for our deployed forces. It's something we need to tackle together um, with our allies and partners uh, in the region. Yes? Hi, um, I have a few questions in regards to Iran. Uh, with uh, President Biden uh, uh, travel to Europe and uh, along with uh, Secretary Blinken. Uh, so my question is, uh, what is this uh, meeting with the um, Britain, Germany, France, and uh, Russian uh, leaders, all of them are still in JCPOA. So uh, my question is that, uh, would they take this opportunity to uh, tell them to do something with Iran to expedite Iran complying with the JCPOA? And my second question is that uh, in uh, his latest uh, press conference, IAA DJ uh, Grossi said that it was becoming increasingly difficult to extend a temporary inspection arrangement with Iran. So does the U.S. feel pressure to join the JCPOA and with the Iran's election coming up? And I promise this is my last question. Um, can you tell us uh, when uh, Special Rep. Amali is going back for the sixth round of talks in, uh, in Vienna? So I'll start with your final question first. We expect that Special Envoy Mali uh, will be returning to Vienna uh, in the coming days, um, probably late this week, uh, to engage uh, in that sixth round of uh, uh, negotiations. Um, indirect uh, negotiations with the Iranians, working through uh, the other, uh, the, with the, working through the remaining members of uh, the JCPOA. When it comes to uh, the IAEA, uh, we are deeply concerned uh, that Iran has yet to provide the IAEA with the information uh, that uh, the agency needs to resolve questions regarding its potential undeclared nuclear material. Uh, these questions relate to Iran's fundamental obligations under its comprehensive safeguard agreement with the IAEA, uh, which is required by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT, uh, and it's separate. Uh, it's a separate issue from Iran's JCPOA uh, commitments. Uh, we fully support Director Grassi and the IAEA uh, as it seeks this required information from Iran. Uh, Iran must comply fully and substantively with the IAEA, and, and it must do so uh, without further delay. Uh, we understand that Iran and the IAEA may meet uh, again in the coming days uh, to discuss uh, these issues, and we'll be watching uh, closely and, again, fully supportive uh, of the Director General uh, as he uh, engages uh, in this. With regard to your uh, first question as to whether Iran uh, will be a topic of conversation with the President, uh, meets with his European counterparts uh, in the coming days. I wouldn't want to get ahead of the White House, but I think I'm on safe ground in saying I suspect Iran uh, will come up. Uh, that said, uh, Vienna, uh, the uh, negotiations, the indirect negotiations uh, are taking place uh, in Vienna, uh, where we do have a forum uh, to uh, interact directly uh, and in great detail 
uh, with our uh, allies uh, and with our partners uh, who remain a party to the JCPOA. Uh, so Special Envoy Mali and his team, when they are on the ground in Vienna, which uh, they again will be uh, in the coming days, uh, do have an opportunity as a routine matter, of course, uh, to meet with uh, and to speak with the French, the Germans, the British, the Russians, uh, and the Chinese uh, who were remain party to uh, the JCPOA. Yes. So follow up with the Iran's election coming up, and uh, so the U.S. doesn't feel any pressure with uh, to expedite this uh, talks and get a deal with Iran? Well, uh, we uh, do recognize that this is a challenge uh, that we need to treat and that we have treated uh, with a good deal of urgency. Uh, and that is not dictated by any sort of electoral calendar. It's not dictated um, by anything other than the fact that the longer Iran remains free from the most stringent verification and monitoring regime ever negotiated, uh, the more potentially dangerous uh, Iran's nuclear program uh, could become. And Secretary Blinken uh, spoke to this in some detail over the past couple days uh, in the hill, uh, on the Hill, making the point that when the JCPOA uh, went into effect, uh, its tremendous advantage was the fact that it extended Iran's breakout time or the time it would take Iran to acquire the fissile material uh, should it attempt uh, to uh, break free of the nuclear constraints uh, from uh, a few months at the time to 12 months uh, to a full year. Uh, now that Iran has distanced itself from key provisions within the JCPOA, uh, Iran has been able to use uh, technology, uh, including more advanced centrifuges, uh, amass additional quantities of um, other nuclear materials that have allowed it once again uh, to uh, shrink that breakout time uh, to a level uh, that we certainly are not comfortable with uh, and we do not think um, our allies, our partners uh, uh, should be comfortable with uh, either. So that's why we're treating this uh, with a great deal of urgency. We're engaged in diplomacy in Vienna because we believe uh, that uh, diplomacy provides the most uh, durable uh, way to, uh, once again, uh, prevent Iran from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon. And that's really uh, what this is all about, the most effective way to ensure that Iran uh, can never threaten the United States, can never threaten Israel, can never threaten other countries uh, in the region or elsewhere uh, with a nuclear weapon. That's where we want to get back to. Yes. Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee led a letter signed by 24 other members to Secretary Blinken calling for the U.S. to take urgent steps with international partners to address Lebanon's worsening crisis and prevent further instability. Uh, what was the Secretary's answer to this letter and did the Department take any steps to address uh, the Lebanese crisis? Uh, I, I will see if we uh, can provide you with any uh, thing on Secretary with anything on Secretary Blinken's response uh, to the letter. But I will just say that um, we have been uh, very much uh, engaged on this. Um, uh, da Ambassador David Hale uh, was uh, uh, in Lebanon uh, not all that long ago, um, engaged uh, on these issues, uh, encouraging um, progress, uh, and above all, um, seeking to provide. Um, uh, uh, humanitarian relief um, to the Lebanese uh, people. And that remains something we're, uh, we remain deeply engaged in. Uh, yeah. Could I ask you about uh, Northern Ireland? Sure. Um, does the United States have a take on the, um, on the dispute between the UK and the EU regarding trade? Do you believe the British should go ahead with, uh, with a trade agreement uh, as, as, as negotiated with the EU? How concerned are you about a flare-up in Northern Ireland as, as a result of this? Well, it's something that uh, we've been uh, watching uh, closely. Um, President Biden has been unequivocal uh, in his support for the Belfast, uh, for the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, it was an historic achievement. We continue to believe it is a historic achievement, achievement um, because it's been central to peace uh, and stability, uh, which we know we must continue to protect uh, and advance. Uh, we welcome the provisions in both the trade and the cooperation agreement uh, and the Northern Ireland Protocol between the UK and the EU. Um, again, um, which will help to protect the gains uh, of the Belfast and Good Friday uh, Agreement. And I think above all, we, we support uh, a close relationship between the UK uh, and the EU and between all communities uh, in Northern Ireland. 
um, as the UK and the EU uh, implement their Brexit uh, related provisions, uh, we will encourage them to prioritize economic uh, and political stability in Northern Ireland uh, and to negotiate uh, within existing mechanisms uh, when those differences arise. Uh, can I just follow up briefly? Like, um, do you think the, the British should actually go ahead with the, the terms as they've been negotiating now? Do you think that it's it's uh, it's been too much of a delay in terms of going forward with it? I, I'm not going to speak to, to what the what the British should do. Um, the United States um, continues to support a close close relationship um, between the United Kingdom uh, and the European Union and uh, all communities in Northern Ireland. Yes. Can I just ask a general question about cyber attacks and ransomware and all of that? Um, I'm wondering if the Biden administration has made a determination as to if it's in the U.S. interest to set international rules of the road um, for cyber attacks, for ransomware attacks, uh, particularly given what we've seen over the last few weeks and the fact that, you know, the president is going to be meeting with international partners this week. Well, I would start by saying there are no international rules of the road to cybercrime. It's criminal. It's illegal. Uh, and uh, it remains the obligation of every uh, responsible state uh, to do all it can to crack down on cyber cr criminals, on cyber gangs uh, who may be operating uh, from within a state's uh, territory. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, if that friend, uh, if that um, country uh, has a friendly relationship with us, has a more uh, challenging relationship with us. Uh, criminal activity is criminal, uh, and states have a responsibility uh, to do all they can to uh, um, uh, put a stop to it. Right, yes. but uh, but we, we do, uh, the United States also engages um, in cyber attacks to a degree, and there are no international rules of, the world, or rules of the road for this. So are you saying the U.S. is not interested in developing those rules because ultimately what we've seen, you know, recently is... Uh, is ultimately criminal. There's no need for rules of the road here. I, I'm not saying that. Uh, your question was about cybercrime, uh, and my response was about cybercrime, uh, which, uh, by uh, definition, in, in this case at least, isn't conducted by states. What we're talking about are non-state actors who are conducting and conducting uh, these uh, cyber crimes. When it comes to states, each state, every responsible state, has a responsibility uh, to do what it can uh, to put an end uh, to this activity. When it comes to um, state operations, uh, you know, that is not something that uh, I would speak to uh, from here, um, but uh, there is a place um, for um, uh, the rules of the road, the uh, rules-based international order uh, that we speak to uh, in the context uh, of other realms. Um, uh, some of those same uh, some of those same uh, rules would, would, would apply. And just one more question. Um, I'm wondering if the Biden administration has made clear red lines for ransomware attacks um, emanating out of a, any specific country uh, in conversations um, with those countries. So, for example, if the United States has told Russia what the red lines are for ransomware attacks that emanate from their country against the United States. We have raised the issue of ransomware attacks um, with any number of countries, and that includes Russia. Uh, I suspect, as you have heard from the White House, uh, that uh, this activity will uh, be a topic uh, when the two presidents meet uh, next week in Geneva, um, but I wouldn't want to characterize those discussions. Take a final question. Uh, yes, I want to give you one. One month away from the expiration of the UN's cross-border mandate for Syria. And I know it's the US preference for that aid mechanism to continue, but in a worst case scenario where the border crossing is shuttered, can you give us a sense of what the contingency plan is? Um, is the US talking with Turkey and coordinating with the aid community to bolster this, the capacity of NGOs on the ground? And is this something that uh, President Biden would raise with President Putin? I wouldn't uh, want to speak to contingencies right now because right now our focus remains on one thing, and that's the reauthorization uh, of uh, these border crossings. Uh, it is uh, of paramount importance to us uh, that when the UN uh, convenes and uh, decides on this, uh, that uh, the Security Council does the right thing. Uh, and the right thing in this case is to uh, reauthorize uh, these crossings so that Syrians who have been a victim to their own government, to terrorist organizations, uh, have the needed relief 
that these humanitarian uh, crossings are able to provide. I will tell you that when Secretary Blinken met with uh, his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, uh, in Reykjavik uh, just the other week now, uh, this was uh, a topic they discussed at some length. And it won't surprise you to hear that Secretary Blinken uh, is quite passionate about this. You heard him address the United Nations uh, six or so weeks ago now, uh, where he invoked not only the humanitarian needs of the Syrian people, um, but spoke of it in very personal terms, uh, speaking of uh, his own children uh, in this context, speaking uh, not only as a Secretary of State, but also as a father, uh, and asking um, how dare us uh, should we not be in a position to uh, reauthorize uh, the, uh, these border crossings? So, uh, of course, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, was in the region uh, just last week uh, to uh, advance these discussions and to put a spotlight on it. We'll continue uh, to do that over the course uh, of the next month uh, when this very important uh, matter comes to the Security Council. Last question. Yeah. The, the administration moved to withdraw some executive orders that were trying to ban TikTok and WeChat, uh, Chinese social media apps. Uh, this department in the previous administration uh, talked quite a bit about the threat of Chinese apps and the kind of danger that these apps pose. And I think the department staff themselves weren't allowed to have these apps on their phone. You know, that was a specific policy that had been brought in. You know, this move today to uh, withdraw those executive orders, does that reflect some different conclusion that the State Department has reached about the, the risk of, you know, downloading TikTok? Is that, you know, or are you still concerned about the risks of, you know, to Americans' privacy and security risks as a result of those? Well, there, there are a couple uh, specific things involved um, when it comes to TikTok, including uh, litigation. But I will say is a uh, general matter that we are committed to promoting an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet, um, protecting human rights online and offline, in supporting a vibrant and a global digital economy. Uh, and we're taking strong steps to protect American sensitive data from collection and utilization uh, by foreign adversaries through connected uh, software applications. That's what was at the heart uh, of uh, the executive order uh, that uh, you saw from the White House today. I'd refer you to the White House and the Department of Commerce uh, for more details on that. Thank you very much, everyone.